I V M. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories, India's very own travel podcast, where each week we share the journey of travelers in their own words and relive their experiences with you, our listeners. Hey guys, welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories. Hope you're all well and keeping safe. On the podcast today, we travel with Upasana Kakati, a traveler and blogger who takes us to one of the most beautiful places we've covered on the podcast so far and no I am not exaggerating let's hop onto the episode and find out where opasna is taking us to so with that introduction we'd love to welcome opasna kakati from the blog unconventional and vivid to the musafir stories hey opasna welcome to the podcast and thank you so much for coming on Hey Saf, thank you so much for having me. I have been listening to Musafir stories for such a long time and it's really an honor for me to be a part of your podcast. You're doing an amazing work bringing out so many stories from different parts of the country. No, thank you, Pasna. I I keep saying this uh, every episode that it is um, completely and full credit to guests like you who are actually agreeing to come and share these wonderful stories and share this with a broader audience. Uh, otherwise without you folks, uh, the Musafir stories would never have even started. So thank you uh, for for agreeing to come on the podcast. Uh, but before we uh, get into the specifics, so Pasna, do you also want to give a quick intro um, about yourself and the blog to to the audience? Ah uh, sure my name is Upasna Kakati uh, I am basically from Guwahati but currently I'm based out of Delhi uh, so right now I work as a copywriter in a media firm uh, prior to that I was working with Nagaland University and that's how I started traveling actually in northeast mm-hmm. india uh, so I've been traveling for 6 years now mostly solo and sometimes it's just very rare that I'm traveling with my friends but mostly I've been traveling solo So uh the whole purpose of starting my blog was obviously first to follow us my love for writing i mean i love writing i love documenting stories and you know uh both a major lay storyteller so you know just clubbing stories from the roads a uh, second purpose and like i think a very dominating purpose was uh, to actually bridge the gap between northeast india to the rest of india mm mm-hmm. So there is so less information about uh, the places in northeast India except for obviously the tourist places like Tawang and Shillong I and mean, people have heard about these places but uh, there are so many other places people don't really have information about how to go there people don't know really about the culture so uh, my main goal was to you know let people know that uh, these are the places and you know you can travel to these places uh, how you can travel so yeah basically you know uh, through the means of tourism probably i was just trying to bridge the gap between a north east india and the rest of the india wonderful i think we are blessed to have uh, natives or uh, locals from the area who are actually uh, going out of the way to do this uh, that way spreading more awareness and also uh, like you said helping out a larger audience um, learn about this also right because uh, mainstream media and uh, even like Uh, our curriculums uh, i mean from an academic perspective i know we definitely don't do justice in terms of uh, covering a lot of different parts of the country that way right and northeast is actually one of them so it's great that um, you and the blog actually focuses on uh, a lot of the travel within northeast um so eagerly looking forward to um, uncovering more and hopefully uh, from the northeast today we'll find out where you're taking us to uh, do you want to give a quick overview of the itinerary or the trip that we'll be covering on the podcast today upasna Yeah sure uh so today i'm going to take you to Mishmi Hills mm-hmm. so uh it's located in Dewan Valley it's a very remote corner of our country which is in Arunachal Pradesh when i say remote it's actually very remote because you don't have internet connection there uh there is no mobile network i think bsnl works very faintly so yeah i'm going to take you on uh, a trek called a seven lakes trek through Mishmi Hills in Dewan Valley Okay, wonderful. Looking forward to this, and yeah, this is. I mean, I know uh, sometimes even um, I personally tend to use uh, 
uh, unexplored and pristine quite loosely. Like I use that to uh, cover like a lot of places or uh, describe a lot of places. But this truly is very, very unexplored, like you mentioned. And we'll see that during the course of the conversation too. Uh, in terms of getting uh, getting to, um, the, uh, let's say, the trailhead or uh, where we start this trek as well, Opasna, given that it's um, pretty, pretty... Um, it's it's not very mainstream right so get it, how how does one get there uh so uh the base is anini so there's a place called as anini in dibang valley so that is the headquarter of dibang valley so um uh, let's say uh the base point is like the first point of journey is let's say guwahati because uh if people are traveling from outside probably mm-hmm. they will end up in either dibrugarh or guwahati so let's just say if people are in guwahati so they can take a bus uh, i'm just talking about like the normal local kind of journey like you know not through the cabs right uh, so let's say someone wants to go to one in on their own so uh, the first thing is either you can take a night bus to roing so there's a place in arunachal roy so that's basically almost in the border of assam and arunachal pradesh so it is well connected so either you can take a train to dibrugarh uh, or tinsukia and take a local bus or a uh, cab from there to roing or you can take a night superb like night bus from guwahati and you, it's a overnight journey and you will reach roing and then there are like these shared cabs uh, which uh, ply between roing to anini mm-hmm. every day at 5:30 like uh, 5:30 am so it's very limited so you know if you have to go from roing to anini you have to book the cabs in advance like a day before or like two days before or maybe like a night before mm-hmm. and 5:30 to 6:30 these cabs leave because the road although it's like newly constructed but yet it is still under construction and again it's a mountain road and it's a remote terrain so mm-hmm. it takes around 12 or 13 hours of journey uh let's say 10 or 12 hours depending on like the road condition So yeah like if you start from Guwahati it will definitely take you two days i mean not less than that to reach anini which is like the base for starting the trek okay so definitely it does require some amount of planning uh, ahead of time it's not that yeah, uh, you just show up there and <laughs> decide to start right so definitely uh, make sure that you're planning uh, and also just because of the nature of the trek uh, it might be ideal to work with a trekking company right it's not uh, something you could probably do solo yourself right no it is not recommended i mean i would not recommend anyone to take that kind of risk you know venturing into mishumi hills alone because uh, actually the landscape is very different uh, as compared to like the uttarakhand or uh, mm-hmm. the himachal mountains yep i mean anyways people should not venture into mountains alone but that landscape is again very very different and it's highly recommended you go with a organized team like there's a organizing team in Udu Trekkers mm-hmm. so they have been organizing the treks uh, since a year now i think year and half or year mm-hmm. so i went with them i think and they are the only organizers at this moment yeah i think that also speaks to the nature of the trek right how right. Uh, remote and off peak this is that there isn't like i mean it's definitely good in one way but um, uh, again like i said uh, make sure you plan ahead of time it's not that you just show up and decide to do this trek you'll need some amount of planning ahead of time um and in terms of the uh, just the overall length of the trek um upasna do you want to give a quick overview of um, how how long this trek is and when one should plan on doing this so it's a eight day trek uh, depending on the weather conditions so for us what happened was one day the weather was very very bad mm-hmm. so we had to stay one night extra in one second camp so uh, for For that reason it took us like 9 days otherwise it's a 8 day trek uh, okay. including the day you climb and coming down to so overall 8 day trek and i think the best month would be during the monsoons because uh it's a flower it's a flowering month so it's all mm-hmm. blooming with flowers uh but if you are a bit hesitant uh with the rain and like uh, you don't want to be like very drenched and you don't want to go into the peak monsoons i think uh Maybe like October, November uh, is a good month when it is fairly dry. Although it's still raining because mm-hmm. you know you cross the rainforest and the terrain is such that you know it just keeps raining throughout the year. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think monsoons it will rain heavily, but also it is like the most beautiful time of the year to go and do that trek because of the flowers. Okay. But I went in the month of October, so it did rain a lot, but mm-hmm. uh, I'm sure it didn't rain as. much as it would have been 
in the monsoons. Okay, okay, wonderful. And just in, uh, from a perspective of the difficulty level of the trek, is, uh, is this like a medium, hard? Uh, how would you categorize this? Uh, I think hard would be like something like really hard. So yeah, I think medium to uh, hard. It's yeah, some, between somewhere the between them. Yeah. So you will have to have a certain level of fitness to uh, do that trek because although you don't gain a lot of altitude, like the maximum altitude is like fourteen thousand feet, mm-hmm. uh, and that you don't stay there. It's one lake that's like fourteen thousand feet, and you come down. But uh, the thing is, the terrain is like very different because it's a very raw route. And it's not very well laid like the Himalayan trek in yeah. Uttarakhand or Himachal. So, since it's a very raw trek, it's like, and then that landscape keeps changing every single day. So, it's like, you're not like just climbing, climbing and then, you know, coming down. It's like up, down, up, down, <laughs> ascend, right. descend, ascend, descend. Yeah. So, it's a mix of that. So, yeah, I think you need to be in proper shape and like you know, be physically fit to do that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, and in terms of uh, just, um, this preparedness right uh, obviously being physically fit is uh, recommended so plan and um, ensure at least a few days before the trek you um, get to a state of physical fitness where you could uh, trek continuously or run continuously for uh, a few minutes uh, but uh, from a packing perspective what would you recommend because again uh, to your point uh, the terrain is pretty uh, harsh so uh, what would you suggest one packs or uh, yeah carries in terms of clothing, gear, etc. Like the first requirement and the most important requirement would be the gumboots. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so I thought like, because I've done Himalayan treks before, so I was like, you know, you always go trekking using your shoes. Right. So I carried my shoes, but luckily I, I bought a pair of gumboots uh, in Anani. Mm-hmm. So, and I think that was the best thing because you need the gumboots because the terrain is very slushy. So yep. there are these points when, you know, your leg is like literally going to go inside the mud. Mm-hmm. So the trekking shoes are not going to work at all. So gum boots are the must. And then you need to have a raincoat. So basically, I would recommend not to use a poncho. Mm-hmm. Just use like a proper raincoat. Uh, you know, it's like proper like the upper and lower uh, okay. raincoat. And then you need like a heavy jacket, like a down feather jacket. Mm-hmm. Uh and then, you know, like a couple of, like, then you need to have odomos because uh, right. while you're crossing the uh, grassland, we have this insect called as dumbbin. Mm. So when they bite, you don't really see them, but uh, they bite you and then, you know, it's very itchy. Oh, so, okay. you know, you need to cover yourself up. Trekking pole is not essential because, you know, they, they will give you bamboo poles. Mm-hmm. There are like a couple of bamboo poles that they they have in place. So, you know, I think... Uh, should not carry a trekking pole, it's an added luggage. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, basically it's very well managed by the trekking group, right? MOD Trekkers. Wonderful. Thanks so much for uh, setting this context beautifully, um, Apasana. Now, without <laughs> much ado and uh, uh, spending any any further time, uh, let's jump onto the trek and um, why don't you take us through this? You mentioned that it's an eight to nine day trek depending on the uh, weather conditions. So uh, why right. don't you start off from uh, day one and give us a quick overview of where you started, what you're looking at day one and the kinds of uh, sights and sounds that you pass through as you're kicking off this trek. Right. So uh, the first day, um, I think you have to leave like really early, like 7 or 8, 30. And then uh, you, the actual trek, it starts from a village called in the village. Okay. So it's around a one and a half hour drive from Anini. Although mm-hmm. it's not very far, but it's the road condition that uh, the roads are not very neat. Like it's like the mountain roads, it takes time. Mm-hmm. So you can say like one and a half hour to two hours is the journey time from Anini to Imuru village. So that's like the day, uh, like the point, trekking point, the start of the trek. Okay. Uh, so the moment you reach there, um, you have to start climbing. The first day is climbing through grassland. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I say grassland, it sounds very uh, easy, something very easy, but it's like a steep grassland. Yeah. <laughs> so you'll have to, it's like a very steep grassland. So, you know, you'll have to put a lot of energy and endurance to like, you know, climb that. Uh, although it's, it's, it's very exciting, it's very beautiful, but I think if you are late in starting the climb, Mm-hmm. It also gets very, very hot. 
Uh, although it's windy and breezy, but uh, the mountain heat is very harsh. The sun is very harsh. So sure. it's very important that, you know, you're well capped and like you put your sunscreen and like you're fully covered and you put your odomas and everything. And uh, yeah, so first day is like, you know, you have to climb through the grassland and uh, then after a point, uh, like once you reach, like there's a point after like one and a half hour, one hour, depending on one's stamina. Mm-hmm. Uh, after that, it becomes sort of fairly easy because you have to like just straight walk. So the initial is quite steep. Right. So initial like one hour is quite steep. After that, you have to plainly walk through the grass. Then it's pretty plain. And uh, I think after the climb is over, you will transition into a rainforest. Okay. So that's just the start of the rainforest where you have the first camp. Okay, yeah. How many how many hours of trekking have we roughly talk about on day one? Uh, so, I was not in the best of my physical fitness. So, it took me some time, six and a half hours or something. But okay. if someone is physically fit, I think for them it would take like three and a half hours or four hours. Four hours, okay. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I think like I was mentioning it to you earlier, right? Uh, one of the biggest injustice we're probably doing is uh, not uh, having like pictures or uh, a video to support this because it's so, so, so beautiful. Uh, and I'm not at all exaggerating this when I say this. It is really one of the most beautiful things I've uh, ever seen on any of the episodes I've covered on the Musafir story so far. And we've covered like 130 plus episodes now. So that kind of speaks to it. We'll definitely make sure we include um, pictures um, to, to so that like listeners can go look them up. But it's really, really beautiful. Even these grasslands that you speak of, uh, they're right. really serpenting and very uh, steep. And I saw like a few drone shots being made uh, during the trek as well. It's uh, really marvelous. Um, and I completely agree to your point that uh, given that uh, one, these are pretty uh, high also, right? They're not like uh, uh, just, just like an ankle or knee level grass. It's pretty high also. Uh, and these... Uh, Dam dims or dum dums? Dum dims, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, that plus the sun, it can get a little harsh. So, make sure you're well prepared. This um, this hat that um, Upasna mentioned, that is also like a lifesaver, especially uh, in this early phase, right? Obviously, from the rain, it protects you, but even from the sun as well, when it's uh, pretty hot, it really protects you. Uh, and you might have to take the help of a mask as well, just to like keep off these uh, dum dums, these uh, and this, uh, these flies, right? Almost black flies right. that they so tend like to. Small black flies and like they bite you and you don't yeah. realize when they bite you. <laughs> yeah, and then when the itching starts, that's when you kind of realize uh, how you've been hit or what is it you. Um, so uh, wonderful. These are the Emuli grasslands, right? Uh, that we yeah. walked through the first day. Now, talk to us about this first campsite and how your experience was there. Uh, the, because this is what in the rainforest you said. Pasta? So it is just the beginning of the rainforest. So okay. Like uh, when you uh, when you are just about to reach the uh, first camp, mm-hmm. so there is a slight ascent, and that is when uh, the rainforest starts. And okay. uh, it's quite soggy and it's all foggy and like you know it's moist because it's always raining and you know you have there's so much nature like uh, it just you feel like okay you are in like the rawest cleanest greenest part of the earth that's what you feel like at this point so yeah the first campsite is known as aniku okay so aniku means grassland there are like two options like there are tents so mm-hmm. some of the trekkers are accommodated in tents and then also they have a logwood hut. Mm-hmm. So basically they use that for cooking but it's uh, it's quite spacious and it's like very nicely built. So uh, you can like there are a couple of trekkers who also sleep there once like the cooking party is over and like a lot of food everyone's eaten their dinner. So okay. yeah so there are like two options in the camp, first camp. Okay, okay, wonderful. So this is the Aniku campsite that you spent the first um, first night at, I'm assuming, right? You spent yes. the site down there. And uh, what is the plan for uh, day two? Like, uh, what is the terrain that you're planning on trekking through? And uh, also, like, how long of a trek is this? So, uh, second day is through the rainforest. So, you know, you have a breakfast and you start as early as you can. Mm. Uh, because uh, I think the second day is the easiest okay. amongst all the day. So, you just have to walk straight, straight. I mean, like, it's not exactly 
purely straight, but yeah, it's comparatively straight. Okay, so, not too much uh, uh, not elevation too much either, of like in terms of uh, yeah, no, ascent? it's not okay. too much of uh, ascent. Uh, but the thing is, it's a very very long loop. Right. So you'll have to just keep walking, walking, walking. I mean, like it's. I think it takes like it took me like eight hours because I was not physically that fit. Mm-hmm. But if someone is fit, probably they can complete that uh, rainforest trek in like uh, five hours. Mm-hmm. Or maybe four, four, four and a half hours, five hours, depending on their speed. Mm. So the rainforest is quite, uh, it's beautiful, but it also becomes gloomy and monotonous at a certain point because, you know, you're just walking through the same thing for like mm. hours and then you just want to reach the second camp. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I think one of the um, very uh, differentiating things I saw compared to day one was... Uh, <laughs> or oh, the overwhelming noises or the cacophony of insects around you, right? Especially in the rainforest, this is like at the peak, I think. The sound of the yes. insects, it's constant, right? Throughout the trek, yes. this was uh, yeah. constantly accompanying you. And uh, uh, yeah, it, it just like it's, it's, it's so different, right? I mean, it's nice. Uh, I think it's really good, like, you know, walking through there. You feel like you're in some Amazonian rainforest <laughs> yeah. or something. I mean, obviously on a list, uh, harsher way but uh, uh, a little bit less as compared to Amazon but yeah you still feel that like you're very close to nature you can like uh, listen to uh, the crickets and all kind of insects uh, you know screaming yeah. <laughs> and like just doing their thing birds and then you know you see this wild mushroom and you see like huge mushroom throughout the entire uh, rainforest trek yeah. Yeah. the second day so yeah it's, it's really nice uh, if you keep observing like things, it's really nice. If the motive is just to keep walking and reach the campsite. It probably gets a bit monotonous, but if you want to observe thing and you know just take break, probably it, it, it is a good route. Plus, yeah. it's a bit gloomy because you know it's again rainforest and it's raining and you know it's like just misty. So you know you're constantly walking through that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, it's also a long day of trek, right? So you yes. <laughs> make sure you prepare to uh, kind of absorb that in and also mentally prepare that it's a long trek. Uh, you know that, But yeah, thankfully, it's not too hard of a trek. So that way you could uh, see through this. Um, and uh, what is the camp uh, at the end of this trek? Well, so it's probably so, like almost the end of day, like evening by the time you hit the campsite, I'm assuming? Yeah, I mean, I reached by evening. I mean, there yeah. were other trekkers with it also. They reached quite before like before yeah. me they reached by around like 2 30 or something but it took me some time so you know like i probably reached by 5 30. okay uh so the second campsite is known as imudu imudu okay imudu yeah so i think that's the prettiest campsite and mm-hmm. i think uh, it's the most prettiest campsite throughout the entire uh trek in the entire trek because you know you have this fairy tale logwood cabin mm-hmm. right in the middle of nowhere so you are in you're like up there in the mountains, like you know, in a rainforest, and you have this beautiful, very cute logwood cabin. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, trekkers are so there is one cabin for which like where the trekkers sleep, and there's another one which is also a kitchen mm-hmm. made of logwood, and the uh, organizers basically they sleep there once the cooking is over and you know, they're wrapped up with everything. Okay, yeah, wonderful. And uh, how big of a trekking group was this, Pasna? That you went? Uh, we were 12 uh, in total. Like the trekkers were 12. Like okay. I think our organizers were more than us. I mean, <laughs> I mean, porters, organizers, and everyone together, they were like more than us. Mm. Uh, there was one uh, female, unfortunately, she had to go down after the second camp. So oh, okay. I think uh, we continued, uh, rest of us, we continued. So we were 11 who continued to trek and completed mm. the trek. So one of the, one of the women, like girls, she has to, she had to go down. So that was in twelve initiative. Okay. Okay. Uh, and in general, like, uh, how was your overall experience? Obviously, you're uh, trekking through the day and everything, but uh, from a perspective of. Um, the trekking guides are they constantly helping you out are they uh, even when you're camped right uh, in way of cooking sharing stories etc like how was that overall experience because that is also very vital to keeping up your spirits right uh, how how you're um, kind of uh, engaging and uh, spending time with your other trekkers and the organizers 
Yeah. yeah, the organizers were really good, like porters, organizers, the cooks, and everyone was like so good because they are really hosp like the hospitality is really good. They're warm yeah. people, like you know. And when you ask them about stories, folklore, and everything, they're so like they're ready to tell you everything. They're ready to share their stories, and they're ready to like you know share their experiences. So I think overall the team was really good. I mean, they were very warm, welcoming, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I think we all had like a very good time. Like once we reached the campsite, we will all gather around the firewood where mm-hmm. the cooking is going on, basically in the kitchen, and we mm-hmm. all would like sit chat. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, so I had an amazing experience, and like uh, they would make sure that you know each of the trekker is fine. Uh, mm-hmm. They are well fed. <laughs> we are well fed. We've eaten well, and you know, we are all doing fine in terms of like our health. Yeah. um cool now um second day you've uh, replenished uh, had a good fill uh, spent some time at the, uh, this is the emudu camp site and uh, what are we looking at day 3 or the next day's trek so for us the day trip was still in emudu camp because the weather okay. conditions were uh-huh. very bad okay. so we basically had to stay one night day extra like in the beginning i told like you know we had to stretch it for 9 days mm uh but uh for us like the third camp site was i think that was like the most difficult trekking part i think throughout the entire journey like the from second to you know the third camp okay uh and even the camp site was very very gloomy <laughs> oh, okay so, so you uh, from like uh, in the third day or like you know in our case it was the fourth day but let, let's just say third day because generally how mm-hmm. it is So in the third day, like uh, you have to uh, start trekking uh, through starting from the rainforest. So I think good half an hour is continuing like the rainforest, mm-hmm. and then abruptly like it ends, and you know the Rocky Mountains they start. Oh okay. So there is a little bit of like vegetation out there, but like mostly it's like all mountains. Mm. And I think that day was like the toughest because you know you'll have to use a lot of technical climbing. Oh, okay. So it's just not you know walking. So I think that day was pretty tough for me. And if there was one uh, guide who was always there for me, mm-hmm. he was just walking with me, he helped me throughout the entire trek because you know it was it got really difficult for me at one point to like you know keep climbing. Sure. So yeah, I think that that day was very tough because uh, it was very very windy and it was misty. Uh, it was all foggy. Uh, although like the lake, you could see the lake like on the other side, but like because of the fog, we couldn't see it. Uh, and uh, the climb was also very steep. As in, it was not exactly steep, but like since it was Rocky Mountain, so you know it's like you have to climb up, then go down, up, down, and it's like big, big leaps you have to take. And yeah. there were a couple of uh, places where you know it's a perpendicular rock, so you know you have to hold onto ropes and like you know put your body weight and like climb through that. So there were a lot of like climbing technical uh, things that we learned, like you know technical climbing involved mm. uh, from the second to the third camp. And like you reached the third camp, uh, so when we reached, it was all foggy. It was uh, drizzling mm-hmm. and it was raining. It was like foggy. It was misty, so you couldn't see anything. and uh, the camp site was unfortunately very very windy like uh, mm-hmm. and it was very gloomy it was not like the first and the second camp site where you know we all were chilling together right and talking and having fun it was just like we had our food and we just slept off like you know we just want to yeah. move on like you know after yeah. this camp site yeah and a much so, tougher uh, trekking day also right like you mentioned very very technical so that we also i think most of you are uh, yes. very tired because of that trek itself um but yeah we finally are at um i guess our first lake at this campsite or yes, very close to this campsite yeah uh the first lake is visible from the uh, the third uh, campsite okay when we reached there we couldn't see anything but mm. when we woke up woke up in the next morning that's when the fog started clearing a bit mm. and that's when we saw our first lake so basically to just see the first lake you'll have to climb two days Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so you have to climb two days just to see the first lake, and then you have like six more lakes to see. Right, right, right. <laughs> so yeah, well worth the wait. The the first lake. Uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, like uh, what is this lake called, and uh, what sort of uh, like all of these are obviously like high alpine lakes. Um, yes. But in terms of the size and everything, like what are you looking at? So the first lake is called as Kamuyu. 
Mm-hmm. I'm in Kamulu and uh, since it was a bit foggy, mm. so we couldn't like figure out the color. But generally on a bright sunny day, it looks blue. Since it's in, in you know the high altitude alpine lake, so it looks like this kerosene kind of color. Mm-hmm. So we didn't really spend a lot of time uh, because you can't really go down to the lake. You know, you can just see from like the cliff or probably like just from your campsite. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that lake is basically sandwiched between like two mountains. Ah, oh, I see. You get good yes. views of the lake, but not necessarily very close. You're not very close to the lake. No, I you can't really down. go down to yeah. the lake. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I think that's also one of the things. Um, which was stressed upon um, like obviously in your blog as well as a, a few other accounts i saw of the trek is making sure that you one obviously you're respecting nature and the surroundings and also like not creating too much of a ruckus and uh, right shouting and all of that right um, because i think the locals are also very particular about that uh, respecting nature and respecting the mountain gods right right so uh Yes, the locals, uh, in fact, even our the organizers and like porters, so they are animist in nature, like they mm-hmm. worship nature. Mm-hmm. So, uh, they believe that, you know, they believe in mountain gods. So, mm-hmm. they don't want to upset the mountain god. Mm-hmm. So, they have been telling us like throughout the entire trek, like right from the very beginning, like before, before we started our trek, there was a briefing, like, you know, how to behave in the mountains and all. Uh, what to do and what not to do so they strictly told us not to create ruckus not, not to scream mm. or you know not to like just go and swim in that lake right <laughs> so don't do it because they believe that you know if you scream and you know if you like create uh, a lot of noise so that basically upsets the mountain god and that's when you know the, the mountain god makes the weather unfavorable for mm. us Mm-hmm. so there has been instances which like they said that there has been like instances where you know like the weather was clear and everything was fine and then there was a group of trekkers who went bonkers like they would just jump in the lake and like you know they would like have fun they would scream and suddenly like you know there would be like thunderstorm and like there would be all heavy rain so i think it's just a belief that they have a spiritual belief yeah Yeah. Yeah, so I mean definitely again uh, one for your own safety, right? Don't yes. uh, indulge in these things, but secondly also like uh, make sure you respect the beliefs of the locals there, right? Because obviously Absolutely. they are the ones who are making this possible in the first place. A lot of these right. things wouldn't have been possible, so it's best to uh, respect their uh, beliefs as well and uh, just make it like a wholesome experience for everyone, right? Uh, just right. not make it untoward. um but yeah weather can literally turn from um, a blink of an eye right it can go from really yeah, nice to really bad yeah weather can so, really change uh, yeah. so that was something like 5 minutes it would be like sunny and then you know it would might rain and again it might the sun might come up so yeah it was like quite a drastic change in the weather like very frequently Yeah, yeah yeah definitely so again drives home the point of being well prepared in terms of your gear and your uh, clothes yes, and uh, the different things you should carry uh, now uh, in terms of the next day right obviously uh, you've gone through the one of the harder days in terms of the trekking and you've uh, made camp close to the first lake the uh, kamuyu lake and uh, yeah. after this what is the plan for day 4 um upasna like uh, how how long of a trek is this and comparatively like to the previous day what type of a trek was this camp 4 was also easy mm-hmm. but uh, from camp 3 to camp 4 so mm. i think this was the most beautiful trek mm. throughout that entire uh, night eight days like it was like the most beautiful Uh, route mm-hmm. so and it was easy with like gentle slopes and you know there was this beautiful rolling hills and mm-hmm. you feel like you know you are the kind of hills that you see in Scotland or you know uh, mm-hmm. if, if you get an idea so you know that kind of landscape was there so it was not a very difficult climb so once you know I think for I think 15 to 20 minutes you have to just cross the rocky mountain path mm-hmm. and the uh, slopes and all and then you know it's just a very breezy walk through the rolling hills so i think yeah the fourth day was uh, i mean like uh, third to fourth camp was pretty easy okay uh, and beautiful so you know it was like combination of easy and beautiful so i think this was the day like you know you enjoy the most you had like at leisure like you know because you reach the fourth camp and that is basically the base camp for next 
so you have the second lake there and mm-hmm. then you know you have like the rest five of the lakes from you'll have to go from there so you you have to like basically stay there for two or three days okay so yeah three three days i think Four. okay like the last day you have to climb down so uh, two two nights i think yeah okay four. so this is basically your uh, final campsite for the yeah the so you well, know right? you know that you know you're going there you know you can just chill for a while like you know you just don't have to like pack your bags every day again right. climb <laughs> so you can like you know just relax for three days you know like this is the place you're going to stay uh for three days and it's beautiful like i think uh you have like a waterfall mm. which is very close to the campsite Mm-hmm. and uh, you have your campsite is basically between two mountains no oh, wow. okay so uh, so you basically call these although it's like foothills of himalayas you can say but you sure. call these as uh, mishimi hills yeah although yeah. these are mountains but you call them like they call it mishimi hills so it's basically between two hills and you know you have a lake right in front of you mm. okay uh, what is this lake this is lake number 2 right uh, what is yeah, it called so, Papasma? It's called Emuya. Emuya Lake. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you have like a waterfall and you have like this beautiful stream flowing through this, uh, this like below the waterfall, like just uh, ahead of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, at night, you know, you have this very beautiful lit, starlit sky. Mm-hmm. So I think that camp is very, very beautiful uh, because, you know, you are like right in the middle of nature. Like, you know, you have mountains, you have stream, you have waterfall, you have the sky. <laughs> and the lake obviously yeah yeah it's literally like somebody has painted this for you right everything exactly. in one <laughs> exactly and then you know that there's this camping site like uh, i mean like cooking place where you know the uh, organizers they cook and all so mm-hmm. you can just sit near the fireplace like there's a fireplace like mm-hmm. this is always like running apart from like night when people are sleeping mm-hmm. so you can just sit chill and you know you can have like unlimited number of like cups of tea like li- like the black tea mm-hmm. and you can just chat with them talk to them uh, i think i had a lot of fun like in the fort camp yeah yeah definitely and in terms of uh, what the team is cooking and feeding you folks uh, uh, i know obviously with the nature of the trek you can't always expect uh the best of foods and everything but like more from a nourishing and energy refilling you uh, refilling you perspective from that perspective is what we uh, t- take it into account uh, but uh, what were you guys usually eating in the camps so dal was there every day dal mm-hmm. rice mm-hmm. so uh, so dal rice and then sometimes it's soya bean sometimes it's uh, just potato mm. and uh, so they carry a lot of tin fish Oh, so if someone is not a vegetarian if someone is a vegetarian probably mm-hmm. you know they would have very limited option mm-hmm. they would just have to eat like aloo or like sort of potato or like pickle mm-hmm. but uh, someone uh, for vegetarians like uh, the option is a bit limited and you mm-hmm. have to just settle down to potato but like non vegetarian because you know northeast is again you know very sure. dominated by non veg type yeah so uh, tin fish is something that was very common like every alternate there was tin fish and then there was soya bean mm. uh, potato and then first day i think it was like uh, there was some leafy vegetables mm-hmm. boiled leafy vegetable but i don't know the dal was somehow very very tasty <laughs> and probably it was cooked uh, uh, like right in the fire like you no know, right. fire and like you know you have this logs burning and they're like just open fire i think probably because of that yeah but some of the dal was really tasty and then you add those tin fish pieces and you know that that was i think delicious for breakfast they would mostly give us bread uh-huh. sometimes maggi and okay. uh, they also had this packet of uh, uh, parathas like i see so flat meat bread yeah so yeah they would give that with pickles so yeah, it depends like okay but they fed us really well like you know i yeah. love the food <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure, uh, especially when you're, uh, like I said, all tired with the trekking and everything, the food also tastes uh, extra, extra good, right? <laughs> exactly. And you can't, like, you know, expect yeah, some sure. off the menu, <laughs> something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no fine dining here for you, but obviously yeah. something that's more practical. I mean, uh, you have the nature, right, yeah. in front of you. I mean, why do you need fine dining? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, and also one common thing that i saw on uh, some of these tracks and uh, probably uh, 
you also experienced this was uh, a lot of these uh, truckers and especially the guides and locals they used to carry i think chana right uh, they used to carry chana and uh, just soak it in water along the way and use that almost like a energy drink right they would drink the water and eat the chana that would keep them like um, super f- uh, like it'll it'll be very filling as well uh, that way it'll keep you, help you maintain energy as you're doing the trek as well that was uh, i think something i saw uh, very commonly done by a lot of the locals too so um, now having spent some time here at uh, one of the most beautiful campsites by um, lake emuya uh, what is the plan a plan now for uh, the remaining so we've covered off two of the seven lakes now and um, right. we're what four days into the trek so how does four it days what, in- yeah what does the plan look like for the rest of the days from here So fifth day, like we cover, uh, we cover two lakes. Okay. So after breakfast, we started our hike uh, at around like let's say nine, eight, thirty-nine. Mm-hmm. And uh, we also have to pack something on the way for the right. winter, like so that we can eat something on the way. Right. Uh, because it's going to take some time for us to reach back, you know. So lunch time, like so, we have basically our lunch like uh, probably close to the fourth lake or you know somewhere. on the way wherever you hang be mm-hmm. so so uh third lake is pretty easy to climb i mean it's like uh, that route, uh, route is very easy like you don't have to really climb like a lot mm. so the third lake is called as oyumbu lake okay oyumbu so it's at an altitude of 13500 feet mm-hmm. although you don't have to climb a lot but it's when you walk like when you're walking towards that lake like not towards the lake but you know like walking through that route mm-hmm. you have to walk, you're walking through a very narrow ridge like it's sort of a scary because you know you see the lake and then you know one misstep in you know there's a chance that you fall down mm. so although it was a very short route and it was not like very uh, steep or something but it was a bit scary because of that part because uh, the ridge was very very narrow okay you don't really spend like a lot of time watching the third lake because you know the fourth lake is i think the highlight of the entire trip uh, okay uh, how so personal like how's it different from the rest of the lakes lake number 4 first of all it's like sandwiched between two mountains and like mm-hmm. it's like the biggest lake okay uh, what's this one called the lake 4 the fourth lake is called dinu lake dinu okay yeah the reason it's like the best is because uh, i think beauty wise uh the landscape is very very beautiful mm-hmm. the landscape is very beautiful like the color is crystal blue like it's like this gorgeous blue and white lake mm-hmm. you know, and then you have this very grayish kind of mountains because you don't have a very, lot of vegetation it's like rocky mountains again mm-hmm. so you have like this gray rocky mountains sandwiched in that blue lake and it's very beautiful i can't even explain how it looks <laughs> like you know, and then <laughs> So definitely something uh, getting your pictures and everything I think this is a really nice uh, point to get some great shots and um right uh, the plan was to cover up these two lakes for this day day for a day 5 whatever that is yeah yeah the f- okay. and once you're done with like a fourth lake again you have to climb down again uh, mm. like climbing down again is exhausting because you know sure. uh, the kind of endurance that you got while climbing from lake third to fourth yeah uh, like the view points are basically the fourth and uh, because you can't really go close to the lakes it's like down but um that day was fairly like short like you know we we came back to our campsite by like 1 or 2 then okay. we had like uh, the rest of the day chill Yeah, so I think that's uh, like we mentioned. One of the good things about the last campsite was you just go back there. So even while traveling, you don't have to pack everything, right? You could uh, right. pack light, just stuff to uh, have on the way. Uh, and uh, the next day is probably the last day in terms of uh, going to the yeah. lakes, right? You're covering off everything the next day. Right. So on the seventh day, we have like last three lakes that we have to cover. Hmm. So it was a hectic day and we were worried about it. Mm-hmm. So it got a it sort of got me scared because I was the slowest in the entire group. So <laughs> okay. I would literally be the last one crawling and you know managing somehow to reach. And by the time I reach people already start leaving so you know. So yeah. it really got a bit scary for me but I was like you know you have to do it like you know you have come this far so you have to have to complete it. Mm. Uh so this day was like uh, the first lake 
the, like the fifth lake mm-hmm. it's called as uh, chenni lake chenni okay so uh, the fifth lake is known to have some magical powers like people believe that you know it mm-hmm. has some magical powers so earlier what used to happen was like basically this is a hunting route uh-huh. so uh, the idumishimi tribe who are native to the bangali they would come to the mountains and like they would hunt for different things a lot of people believe that you know the there's a gl- there's a glow that comes in the lake at midnight Mm-hmm. and it's because of some magical power that the uh, lake has mm. uh which is again like some people claim that they've seen something like that so the boy had like one of our guides with us mm-hmm. his father was a hunter mm-hmm. he too was a hunter but like now he has quit hunting but uh, uh when his father used to come for hunting and uh, that's when his father saw like they used to take shelters in the caves nearby from the caves you can see that the fifth lake so they say that like there's this glowing light that comes at midnight from that lake and, and it has like some healing power and like some magical power mm. so there were like two guys from the trek who also like they wanted to see if there is something that is mm. there so just before that like when we climbed the fourth and the fifth lake mm. uh, no sorry the third and the fourth lake there were three mm. guys who went with one of the guides and they stayed overnight in the caves mm. just to see if there was some some magic power they could see some lights but unfortunately they did not see anything <laughs> okay so yeah it is known to have some mystical power but again mm. we don't really know you know that it's right. true or it's just folklore and you know sure. based on some people who have seen it yeah very interesting and this is the cheni lake you mentioned right cheni lake the fifth yeah. lake yeah and uh, after you're done with that like you know you finally summit so uh, the final lakes are called as huhu huhu 1 and huhu 2 so huhu. it's like okay. yeah huhu so huhu 1 lake uh, continues and then it falls from one mountain and it continues and it becomes a huhu 2 so okay. there are like two lakes which are you can see the both of the lakes from the same view point mm. so like 6th and 7th like basically it's a long climb from the fifth lake to the sixth and seventh so yeah it forms like from one mountain top to another so like two lakes are like close to each other so you know by the time like uh, i reached the summit it was raining heavily mm-hmm. so i couldn't really spend like a lot of time and that's when i also started feeling a bit of like altitude sickness like i mm-hmm. started feeling a bit of uh I was suffering from a bad headache kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think after spending maybe twenty minutes, you know, mm. uh, we had to make our way down because I was the last one who was there. Mm. Yeah, this is uh, you're saying, um, I guess between thirteen and fourteen thousand feet, also, right? So yeah, probably yeah. one of the reasons. Uh, and also it was a long day like you said in terms of uh, it's pretty packed right you're visiting right. literally three lakes that day and uh, like you mentioned between uh, lake 5 and uh, lake 6 and 7 the distance is also quite a bit so a lot of things a lot of factors might have come into play uh, but yeah how how's the feeling uh, <laughs> upasna uh, i mean yeah not really a summit in the sense of a summit of a mountain but in terms of your trek this is the summit right lake 6 7 it oh, was an feeling. amazing feeling because <laughs> uh, first of all like i was not physically fit right and uh, you know it i have been planning to go on this trek like from like the very beginning from the first time when i really saw like because mm-hmm. i told uh, like i, was, I mentioned not you right that this is like a very new trek and it's just been like a year or something when yeah. they started conducting the commercial treks like mm-hmm. that locals so ever since i saw these pictures i really wanted to go so it was like a very very happy moment for me despite like all the hardship despite <laughs> all the exertion like you know despite me like you know i thought probably will i be able to do it or not because you know i was not physically that fit like but since i was in the summit like you know at least the end of the trip mm. so i was very very happy and sort of like i was also caught in like a lot of emotions because you know i felt like i've come so far like you know just to see this and this is it Yeah yeah so i just wanted to like sit there and stare at both of these lakes like because i knew like you know i'm not coming here again so yeah i think this is one of those probably once in a lifetime type of treks right exactly. it's not very easy and not very accessible um so all of those factors obviously if you'd like to you could go back but uh yeah for more often than not it's going to be once in a lifetime type of experience so yeah definitely does get to you emotionally as well right 
Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you were able to uh, complete this almost unscathed, I, uh, I could say. Uh, and uh, yeah, just sort of the whole nature of the track itself, right? Very new, very unexplored, very raw, and it's not uh, overtly commercial like a lot of the other tracks. So that way, the overall experience is also so very different, right? Uh, I think one of the things that uh, was being called out as well was that you will not find even one... Um, I mean, the Himachali tracks are now becoming so... Uh, kind of uh, mainstream that you find lit right. literally small dhaba type of things, right? The tapris exactly. from place to place serving you like hot chai and maggi and all of that. None of this over here. Uh, here it's really raw, really hardcore where you actually uh, tough, uh, tough it out for yeah. seven, eight days. And it's untouched. Yeah. Like, that's the best part. Like it's untouched. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So that way, very, very unique experience. And I'm assuming... Um, Probably like after this, you're uh, basically retracing your route back, right? Right. Thanks so much for beautifully explaining uh, all of the like in detail, the overall track, the preparations, the uh, even the scenes and the sounds and uh, everything that you see around you while you're making this track. Uh, in terms of the locals of the people as well as uh, I'm sorry, in terms of the locals as well as the uh, folklore and the legends associated to this trek or even this place in general right are there any stories that you heard on the way from the trekking guides that you'd like to share upasana yeah i mean i spoke to my trekking guides a lot uh, mm -hmm. like you know just wanting to know about their culture like you know their beliefs and like uh what stories they have to tell folklore basically so mm -hmm. i really love like listening to that mm -hmm. so yeah like uh, they told me a couple of stories uh so uh, that also they heard from somewhere like you know like mm -hmm. I earlier mentioned like you know they ought to warn us like not to scream a lot mm -hmm. not to like you know do something that is uh, harming the nature because right. you know it's like them they have a huge reverence for the mountain gods you know they, nothing to disappoint the mountain gods so so there were like couple of stories so there's this one story I don't know whether it's true or not but they said that it's a true story mm -hmm. so uh, so they basically respect that pose mm. like Frogs, so uh, is, frogs, yeah, yeah. yeah, so that pose is something that are not supposed to be harmed. Mm. And uh, when you are in the fourth lake and throughout the lake, like route also, you see like a lot of dead poles and like, especially in the fourth uh, campsite, mm -hmm. uh, there are these streams, right? So you see like a lot of dead poles. So you're not supposed to disturb them at all. Mm. So there's a story uh, where, you know, there were a couple of trekkers who went for this trek. Uh, so they were like local guys, local trappers. Mm. And so there was one guy like, you know, he would kill all that poles and go mm. on the way. And the other guy, there was the other, like, another guy, he would not do that. Mm -hmm. He would just tell him, why are you killing the dead poles? So, so he just kept doing that, doing that throughout the entire uh, route. Mm. So while coming back, uh, what happened was there was uh, this moment like, you know, uh, when they they both were resting under a tree and suddenly they, there's a branch that f fell mm. and uh, somehow they both escaped mm. and it didn't really hurt anyone. Now, while they were going back, they were crossing the stream. So, like, the guy who was actually trying to protect the temple, he, like, everyone basically crossed the stream properly, even, like, that guy. But the guy who was killing the temple while he was crossing, mm. suddenly, like, you know, there was this uh, huge... Uh, stream of water that started coming like you know and then he just got flooded away mm, flooded, like like, he was, yeah, yeah yeah he was like yeah there was a current and like you know just like you know he was swept off with the current mm. so yeah i think that is like you know killing the dead pool is like not a good thing it's a bad omen yeah so that is one folklore mm. uh, about like uh, about the trek mm -hmm. uh, there are a couple of others like one is basically uh they say that, uh, you know, there's this story of a hunter and like two frogs. So there were like two frogs which are fighting with each other. Again, this is a folklore. I'm sure like this is not like a true st story, but mm. it's very interesting to hear. Like, So uh, there was this hunter who went to hunt and then um, there were two dead fools that were fighting with each other. So he tried to like separate them. And then there was one dead fool like, you know, who was about to die. Somehow he nursed that dead fool. Mm -hmm. life and then uh, he was there in the cave and like he would go hunting during uh, the day and then come back and he would see like someone has already kept meals mm -hmm. for him mm. so uh, so after that 
that would keep happening like day after day and then one day he just hid and like he just wanted to know like you know what who has kept the meals so there was this woman who actually would come and keep the meals for him so he asked like why are you doing this so she said that she is basically the daughter of the dead pool mm. and uh, since uh, he saved the life of that uh, not the dead pool but the frog mm-hmm. um, so since uh, he saved the life of the frog that's why you know they are returning the favor and they are helping him out Mm-hmm. So that is one folklore. So I think there are a couple of others. Like I don't really remember all of them, but mm-hmm. uh, like talking to the guides and the organizers, it was very, very good to like you know know their stories, their belief. Yeah, definitely. Uh, again, we have been very uh, like you mentioned at the beginning, very cut off from a lot of the uh, just the local tribes and their practices and mm-hmm. everything. Right? We have just been so. Uh, and aware of all of them so it's really good to just get a, hear a lot of these stories uh, like i mentioned all of these are folklore but definitely right. it's it's uh, good to know and uh, basically these are the mishmi folk right they're called as the yeah uh, mishmi tribes yeah this one in specific is idu mishmi there's also the miju mishmi i think that's the other yes. um, tribe as well right uh, so right a lot of uh, very unique uh, practices traditions very right. interesting uh, culture overall so for somebody to um, learn about that know about that is also very interesting and i'm sure some of the um, the local guides would be from those tribes right the tribesmen so yeah all all of the guides yeah were in dumishmi and they have like amazing really interesting festivals and yeah. like the food is delectable yeah yeah so not on the trek but if you make another trip uh, around the around the region uh, it'll be a good opportunity to interact with a lot of these uh, tribes as well and learn a lot more about them but uh, thank you so much upasna we really really like to thank you for uh, taking us on this uh, wonderful journey although vicariously but you so beautifully laid it out for us right from the uh, different sites and the scenes one goes through from grasslands to rolling hills to rainforests to rocky mountains and getting a view of these uh, wonderful literally magical alpine lakes i would say right uh, and also these folklore that are associated to them it's just like icing on top of the cake it just makes the overall experience so so wholesome thank you for sharing that wonderfully with us we'll make sure to include uh, not just the social handles of uh, opasna but also a link to the blog so people can check it out and yeah we'll 100% make sure that we include the pictures because uh, this is only half of it what we're speaking to obviously being and doing the trek is the real deal but at least the pictures will give you a little more insight into uh, what the real and raw beauty of arunachal of dibang valley and the seven lakes trekkers thank you so much opasna once again for being on the musafir stories podcast thank you so much <laughs> That was yet another great episode on the Musafir stories. Make sure to show us some love by sharing the podcast with your friends and family. We are on Instagram and Twitter at Musafir stories. If you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can listen to us on the IVM podcast app or the website. Follow us on our social media. We are at IVM podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you.